Good evening, everyone, once again, and a hearty welcome to today's webinar. Let me begin by thanking you all for taking the time and interest to join us today on our session on the UAE corporate tax. My name is Jyotika Ranjit, and I've been working with Kothari Auditors and Accountants in the Tax and Compliance Department. Before we proceed to the session, I'd like to give a brief introduction of our company, Kothari Auditors and Accountants, better known as KAA. Established in the year 1992, KAA has been proudly serving in the professional field for more than 30 years, providing management and financial consulting services, including audit, accounting, tax, and company registration services. KAA operates in two offices located in Khalid bin Walid Street in the Emirate of Dubai and Bank Street Rola in the Emirate of Sharjah. Our associate office, Global Business Services DMCC, which was established in the year 2010 and located in Jumeirah Lake Towers, specializes in the formation of global entities, trusts, and foundations in the UAE and worldwide. As you are all aware, the corporate tax has already become effective in the UAE from the 1st of June 2023, which means as we speak today, some of you are already on your first tax period, while some of you would have a few more months left before your first tax period begins. It is therefore of utmost importance that we are updated of the recent cabinet decisions and clarifications that have been issued by the Ministry of Finance, which would be necessary for the businesses to plan for a smooth implementation of the corporate tax. As always, the KAGBS group is committed to ensure our clients are updated of the latest clarifications issued by the authority. And we shall therefore have you all here at yet another session on the UA corporate tax series. With this note, I'd like to introduce our speakers for the day. It's my privilege to introduce before you Mr. Vipul Kothari, the founder and head of KA and GBS. He has the distinction of passing the Chartered Accountancy at the age of 21 from the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India and went on to receive gold medals from Beke School of Business Management in MBA Finance. We also have with us Mr. Prasad Bonde, Director, Audit and Tax. He is a company secretary in addition to many more professional qualifications and has over 20 years of progressive experience in the professional field. We also have with us Mr. Kapil Shet, Manager, Tax and Corporate Compliances, who will be joining us during the panel discussion at a later part of the session. He's a Chartered Accountant and has over 11 years of experience in the field of international transition and corporate tax in India and Oman. Before I hand the session over to the speakers, please note that the session is being recorded and all the participants are muted. In case you have any questions, please raise them in the chat box and we shall answer them at the end of the session. So without delaying any further, let's move on to the session. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Jyotika, for your words of introduction. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome, everyone, to this uh, another webinar on corporate tax in UAE. Uh, as Jyotika mentioned, uh, corporate tax is effective now from 1st of June 2023. And uh, just before the Eid holidays, a couple of weeks before the Eid holidays, uh, we had several cabinet decisions being issued uh, in reference to the corporate tax and the clarifications on various matters which were pending because the law was announced, uh, but thereafter uh, in the law at several places, the, there was a reference that you know cabinet or ministerial decision would be issued and uh, the clarity on certain matters will be provided by way of those cabinet or uh, ministerial decisions. So today we are going to cover primarily on three or four major aspects with respect to the cabinet decisions which have been announced. Uh, in the past webinars, we have already covered the broad aspects of corporate tax, taxability, tax uh, grouping, what are the tax rates, uh, what are the exempt income, deductible, non-deductible expenditure, and those you know basic things have already been covered in the uh, past. So we are not going to cover that. Today we'll be focusing on three or four major aspects. Uh, so I'll be taking primarily on taxation of natural person because there was a cabinet decision with respect to what income of a natural person would be taxable and the uh, uh, exemptions which are available to natural person and i'll also be covering on the free zone person because i believe many of you are based in free zone and have free zone based businesses or international businesses so i'm sure that that is uh, keenly awaited that you know how free zones are going to be impacted and my colleague uh, prasad bonde he'll be covering on the uh, interest uh, rate deductions, you know, what is the uh, provisions with respect to interest deductibility, as well as 
the uh, transitional provisions, which are also very important and which needs to be factored in at the beginning of your first tax period. So, and thereafter, we'll cover on what is required to be done for the companies to be ready to implement tax smoothly. So, first and foremost, on the taxation of natural person, uh, I'll just skip through this slide, but just to highlight that as we had seen earlier, that all natural persons uh, which are conducting business or business activity in UAE are considered resident taxable person and hence uh, their income from business business activity in UAE will be taxed. However, what is constituting business or business activity? And there were some doubts with respect to that because the corporate tax law had not clarified specifically on the business activities. Uh, what would be constituting and whether personal income or investments uh, or real estate would be constituting as a business or business activity. And that is now clarified by way of a cabinet decision, uh, which primarily states that any person, whether it is a resident or a non-resident individual, so it's a resident or non-resident natural person, which carries out business or business activity. Now, business or business activity primarily is if we go to the earlier slide, it is an, any economic activity that is carried out either short term or for a continuous longer term period by an individual is considered a business. And you need to have some sort of system and organization to the activity that you are carrying out. So what this would mean is that anyone who carries out business or business activity would mean that he will have to have a license in UA in order to carry out that business or business activity, or he may be carrying out that business activity as a freelancer. So let's say if a freelancer does not take license, but provides consulting services on freelance basis, technically that would be considered as business activity, though he has not taken a license. Other than that, all sole establishments will get covered under the natural person taxability and uh, because it is conducting business, business activity in UAE in the name of an individual, which is not an incorporated entity, and hence it is not a juridical person. However, one relief which has been provided is to the small businesses that if such individually carried out businesses are having turnover of less than, mind you, it is turnover, so gross revenue, less than 1 million dirham in a calendar year, in that case, they are not required to be registered for corporate tax and they don't need to pay. And if they are having income more than gross revenue, more than 1 million, then definitely they need to register and pay for the corporate tax. So a natural person carrying out business, business activity, this relief has been provided. Also clarification has also been provided with respect to what will not constitute a business, because this is very important specifically for many people who have a lot of investments. And in that case, you know, the doubt was whether personal investments, real estate investments will get covered. So it has been clarified that the business or business activity for natural person will not include three aspects. One is the personal investment. So any investment activity, which is carried out in personal name in personal capacity and which does not require licensing to carry out that activity. Or real estate investment, also income from say leasing, subleasing, renting of the real estate property, again, which does not require license or licensing from the local authority. That will not constitute business or business activity. And of course, salary, wages, allowances, or any compensation received from employer by an employee will not be considered as business, business activity, and hence it will not be taxable. That's why this is a big relief for a lot of individuals who hold properties. And even if you have one property or you have hundreds of properties, as long as you are carrying it out as an individual, uh, you just rent and you do not have a business license to carry out that particular activity. In that case, that real estate investment and the income that you earn out of it will not be taxed and liable to be uh, reported for the corporate tax purpose. So this is a big relief for many individuals who hold properties. However, one caveat here, if let's say you have lot of properties and you have a license where which 
you utilize for carrying out your business of real estate in that case it would basically fall under the business or business activity and then in that case real estate investment may not be qualified for exemption and it might be chargeable to corporate tax again in this case specific of the operations and the business how it is being conducted will need to be looked at to determine that whether it would be taxable in that case or not or what structuring uh, might be uh, necessary in that case with that just one more thing that i also wish to highlight here is there are many individuals who own foreign companies like you might have a bvi company or a seychelles company wherein you might be a ua resident as a ua resident you might be sole director shareholders or your family members based in ua might be sole shareholders directors in that case such a company even if it is based in bvi will get covered as a taxable person if you see here in taxable person the second item under resident foreign juridical person effectively managed and controlled in ue and entire income of that bvi company or seychelles company would be liable to ue corporate tax however there are situations where you might have a foreign company but the directors are independent based overseas they are not based in ue you don't have business or business activity in ue but you have property in ue and you earn immobile uh, you have property income immobile property and you have earn immobile uh, income from that property in that case such non resident uh, entities will be considered to have nexus in ue and they will be treated as non resident taxable person and they will be required to register for corporate tax so again having just property but the place of management control is based overseas but having property in ue will still uh, be liable to file ue corporate tax and pay tax on it uh, with that uh, we'll move on to the most important part of uh, today's uh, session which is the qualifying free zone person now there are very many aspects that needs to be looked at to determine that you know what is qualifying free zone person so let's dissect one by one we'll first look at what is a qualifying free zone free zone of course all of us knows that there are very many free zones in ue more than 40 free zones each free zone has its own set of rules regulations and a decree or a legislation by which it is established or set up so that is their free zone but what is a qualifying free zone so what the law says is that qualifying free zone will be one which has granted some tax incentive or tax holidays to the companies which are registered in that free zone by way of that free zone legislation or regulation or a decree so a decree or a legislation by which that free zone is established generally will specify that certain number of years tax holiday is granted to companies which are being registered in that free zone now if you are based in a free zone and that legislation of that free zone talks of this tax holiday period then you will be your company in free zone will be considered as a qualifying free zone when the questions were asked to the ministry of finance during their uh, you know awareness sessions uh, they had mentioned that uh, you will need to check that whether your free zone comes under qualifying free zone or not with the respective free zone authority so the first and foremost that all of you need to do who have companies in free zone to check with your free zone authority that whether your free zone and the company that you are in will be considered as a qualifying free zone person or not so this is the first aspect that you know decide and get a clarity that are you based in a qualifying free zone second condition that or multiple conditions that you will need to fulfill to be called a qualifying free zone person now there are in all total around seven conditions first is that it has to be a juridical person meaning incorporated registered uh, in a free zone which would include branch of a non resident person so branch of a foreign entity also registered in free zone will be considered uh, as a part of a qualifying free zone person 
Second condition to be fulfilled for qualifying free zone person is that you need to maintain adequate substance in the free zone. So this clearly mentions that if you carry out any business activity and you want to claim free zone benefit of 0% corporate tax, you need to have adequate substance in the free zone. Now, substance has not been defined, but if we look at the economic substance regulation, it clearly mentions adequate substance would require adequate office space, adequate employees, adequate operational expenditure in the free zone. Of course, it may be in the same free zone or you might outsource it to someone else within the same free zone or some another free zone but effectively it has to be in the free zone that substance has to be there in the free zone so if you just have a paper company with no office no staff no operational expenditure and just doing transactions and billing and generating profit will not satisfy this substance test and will not be then qualified as a free zone person and hence will not get the 0% tax benefit. Other major condition is that it derives qualifying income. Now, what is qualifying income will come to in the subsequent slides because that is little more complicated and there are certain calculations involved. So we'll look at that in the later part after this slide. Another condition is that this free zone person is not elected to be subject to normal tax regime. This means that every free zone company has an option to opt for either a normal tax regime, which is which is applicable to mainland and other you know taxable person, which is up to 375,000, uh, zero percent beyond that, nine percent. So you can opt for that normal tax regime and follow those. Then you don't need to go through this qualifying free zone person uh, conditions, and you do not need to meet even probably let's say substance test or those you know are not directly required to be fulfilled. Of course. Uh, it is always advisable that if you are carrying out business in UAE and generating profit, substance should be maintained in UAE because of the BAPS uh, transfer pricing uh, regulations as well as the uh, base erosion profit shifting uh, uh, you know, criteria of the OECD. It is essential that companies should have adequate substance. The fifth uh, condition is that every free zone person uh, will need to comply with transfer pricing documentation and arm's length pricing. Now, transfer pricing documentation will be with respect to all the transactions with related parties as well as connected persons. Now, related parties have been defined very widely in the uh, law. It is up to the fourth degree of kinship and connected person would mean any director, shareholder, officers who are again connected in operation and management of the company and drawing remuneration or benefits from the company. So transfer pricing documentation would mean you need to do proper transfer pricing study, benchmarking and justify the pricing at which you have sold your goods or services that they are on arm's length basis. And there are certain formulas or certain uh, rules which have been given for the uh, arm's length pricing that you can follow. The sixth condition is that the non-qualifying revenue, so this is linked to what is qualifying and non-qualifying revenue, which we'll come to in subsequent slide, but just to highlight here that it does not exceed the de minimis requirement. Now, de minimis requirement also is defined in subsequent slide, which says that your non-qualifying revenue cannot exceed 5% of your total revenue or 5 million dirham, whichever is lower. So in very, uh, you know, wider terminology, if I put it, let's say if you have a total revenue of 100 million dirham, out of which 6 million is your non-qualifying revenue and 94 million is your qualifying income, technically, you have failed the de minimis test because it requires either 5% or 5 million, whichever is lower. So in that case, if you do not fulfill that, you don't get the benefit of free zone person. And then there are wider implications. If you fail this test, then for this year, as well as for next four years, you cannot claim the free zone person benefit and 0% tax rate. And the last and the most important part is that you need to prepare audited financial statements, uh, which are required to be prepared for uh, by a free zone person if you want to claim the 0% uh, tax benefit under this qualifying free zone conditions. 
for other companies which are in mainland audited financials is mandatory uh, only in case of turnover there are turnover limits beyond which you need to maintain which is 50 million dirham and plus now what is qualifying uh, free zone qualifying income and the non qualifying income we'll look at that so first what i'm doing is let's say in your entire pot of income first you segregate these income so if you have income from domestic permanent establishment so suppose as a free zone company you have established a branch office in mainland this will be considered as your domestic permanent establishment any income that that domestic permanent establishment generates profit that it generates will be taxed at flat 9% no deduction of minimum 375000 threshold if you have a foreign permanent establishment meaning a foreign branch office of your free zone company in for example india you have a branch office that also will be taxed at 9% so you have to maintain separate books of accounts and provide separate financials for that because that will be taxed separately then if you have properties in free zone now if you have a non commercial property in free zone now non commercial here is defined slightly differently than our normal vat terminology in vat hotel uh, apartments or furnished apartments uh, are considered as commercial however in case of uh, this uh, corporate tax it is being considered as non commercial property so any residential property which includes hotels furnished apartments or you know such uh, shared uh, service departments all will be considered non commercial and it will be taxed at 9% flat and suppose if you have a commercial property in free zone but you have rented it to a non free zone person meaning the tenant is not a free zone company it is a mainland company for example or some other individual for example uh, then in that case also it will be taxed at flat 9% so primarily these four income you have to first remove from your kitty or from your total pot of income so suppose your income again we go to the same example if it was let's say 110 million suppose 10 million constitutes these four categories of income remove that 10 million 10 million will be taxed directly at 9% now balance 100 million which remains how do we segregate it so we'll go to the next slide on what is qualifying and what is non qualifying income now that is where 100 million will be now split into qualifying and non qualifying so first let's look at uh, the tax law has specified that there are certain excluded activities so even if you are based in free zone but you carry out these activities it is considered as excluded and it is not considered as qualifying income now what are these these are if you have transactions with natural persons so if you are based in a free zone for example you have a uh, a showroom for example or you have a restaurant in a free zone but you are serving natural person so when you are serving natural person technically it's an excluded activity so you will not be entitled to claim that as qualifying income and you cannot get zero percent benefit on that there are other you know transactions with natural person except of course uh, operation management of ship fund management services wealth management these are allowed to be dealt with as uh, by a free zone person and not considered excluded activity banking activities is excluded uh, insurance activity other than reinsurance is excluded finance leasing is excluded other than treasury and financing to rp so if you are doing financing to related parties then it is not considered as excluded it will be uh, possible to you know if it is uh, again fulfilling the conditions for qualifying uh, activities it will be considered as qualifying income uh, ownership exploitation of immobile property we already looked at in the previous slide that it will be taxable at nine percent and of course there are uh, uh, aircraft and shipping related uh, activities and uh, intellectual property assets now, if you have a free zone company which owns or holds certain IP assets and it generates income, it is considered as excluded. So technically that income is not going to be considered as qualifying income and not entitled to 0% uh, tax uh, benefit. And any activities ancillary to above uh, will be considered as excluded. 
Uh, now, qualifying activity, I'll come to a little later because it pertains to primarily one third section of my particular this uh, part of the calculation. Now, as we discussed, you have 100 million of total income other than the property and that permanent establishment related income. Now, we have to split that into qualifying and non-qualifying. So, first, we have to check the first condition here is, let's say, are you doing transactions with another free zone person? Now, if you are doing transactions with another free zone person, then you have to check, is that customer of yours, is he the beneficial recipient of the goods and service? So, suppose if you are selling to him, is he buying in, on his own account or is he acting as an intermediary or an agent on behalf of some third party and he will just pass on those goods to some third party directly? Now, this is going to be challenging to decide on or to determine that whether the customer of yours is independently acting person or it is he is acting as an intermediary or an agent. But the law says that if he is not the beneficial recipient, then the turnover or the transaction that you have done with him will be considered as non-qualifying income. But if the customer of yours, you can determine that yes, he is the beneficial recipient of the goods and services. Then one more check you have to do is that is it from the excluded activities? So which we saw that excluded activity list that if you deal with natural person or with respect of commercial property for non-free zone persons, those excluded, if it is part of that, then again, that also will be considered as non-qualifying income. And if it is not excluded activity, meaning let's say if you are just doing trading supply of goods to another customer based in free zone or supply of services to another customer, which is again uh, registered in free zone. And he is receiving those goods and services on his own account, then it will be considered as qualifying income and it will fall under this 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.2. It will be considered as qualifying income. So this was about your transactions between free zone to free zone person. Now there is a situation where let's say as a free zone person, you might deal with non-free zone person. This would mean non-free zone would mean you supply goods or services to either mainland people or companies based in mainland or you supply goods or services to companies which are based overseas. Now in this also, again, we have to check that is it falling in the qualifying activities or not? So specifically for transactions between free zone and non-free zone person, it is specified that these are the qualified activities. Now, if you look at that qualifying activities, what it primarily covers is manufacturing. So a free zone company manufacturing goods and services and selling the goods to a non-free zone let's say a foreign company overseas or a mainland company will be considered as qualifying activity and they'll be entitled to 0% corporate tax. So it will be considered as qualifying income provided of course they fulfill the de minimis requirement. Then there are other qualifying activities like processing of goods, holding of shares, management to operation of ship, reinsurance, fund management, wealth management, which are not going to be relevant to probably many of us. Headquarter services to related party also is a qualifying activity because there are many companies which have presence in UAE, which acts as headquarter and they render service to their global operations. So that is covered as qualifying activity. Treasury financing to related parties. So from free zone, if you render services to related parties uh, of treasury or financing, uh, that is also covered. Leasing of aircraft, logistic service, distribution of goods in or from a designated zone to a customer that will resell such goods, material, parts thereof, or process alters such uh, goods, materials, parts thereof for sale or resale. Now, this is the most trickiest part of qualifying activity, because if you see in this, as a trader be based in a free zone, if you do third port shipment, for example, or if you are selling goods to non-free zone companies, will you be entitled to benefits of qualifying income and look at the 0% uh, tax? 
this is the clause which basically will cover this you know that sort of trading or distribution so again has to be looked at now one of the critical condition here is that distribution of goods in or from a designated zone which means that you be, uh, should be based in a designated zone and supplying goods or services from that now this is one gray area for third port shipment or free zone companies dealing with non free zone for trading purposes and in this respect again the uh, uh, minister of finance had said that they would be in their awareness session that they would be coming out with some clarifications on uh, interpretation of this matter so till that clarification comes trading of goods from free zone to non free zone is going to be a little bit of a gray area and then there are ancillary activities so coming back to this qualifying income classification if again point number 2 that we are looking at that income from transactions with non free zone person you have to first check that are you falling within the qualifying activities and also check that 2.1.1 that excluded activities is it covered under excluded activities or not if it is covered under excluded activities then it is non qualifying and if it is not covered under excluded activities and it is not excluded activities it will be considered as non qualifying income and any transaction that a free zone person does with non free zone person which is not in the list of that qualifying activities the these ones 13 that we saw that will be considered as non qualifying income so your total income has to be split into this two buckets now this two buckets once you split you total up how much is your total qualifying income how much is your total non qualifying income and what is the total of both this which is considered as total revenue now this three uh, figures total qualifying income total non qualifying income and the total revenue that we arrived at over here will have to be considered for this de minimis test as per the law now what the de minimis test it says is that if your non qualifying income is less than or equal to 5% of your total revenue or 5 million dirham whichever is lower then you have fulfilled the de minimis test and your entire income which is your total revenue will be charged at 0% tax however if either your non qualifying income exceeds 5 million or your non qualifying income percentage exceeds 5% of your total revenue then also you would have failed the de minimis test and you will have to pay 9% tax on the full income so you do not get any 0% benefit on any income you will have to pay 9% on the full amount of income and another issue that will arise is that once you have failed a de minimis test for one year for this same financial year as well as next four years you are disqualified to claim the free zone person benefit or qualifying free zone person benefit so this is a major thing which the free zone companies will have to look at will have to start now looking at that are they qualifying free zone or free zone and free zone person so i'll just come to that summary that you know what free zone companies will need to do in the subsequent slide so let's look at primarily before we go to that what are the benefits and of course obligations or drawbacks of being a qualifying free zone person of course benefit is if you fulfill the de minimis test then your 0% you will have 0% corporate tax on your income uh, which is you know your total revenue except the ones which we saw earlier that you know from domestic permanent establishment foreign permanent establishment and from properties within the free zone on that you pay 9% of course flat but on all the other income whether it is qualifying and non qualifying both uh, will be 0% however to claim this free zone person benefit and claim 0% benefit uh, 0% tax rate you will have to fulfill all the qualifying free zone person benefit conditions 
which are there. You have to have audited financial statements and you cannot claim the transfer of assets or qualifying group or small business relief, which are available to other uh, companies, which have not claimed this benefit. Also, you cannot transfer the tax loss. You cannot be a part of a tax group. Uh, there is no threshold of 375,000 uh, on that 9% uh, tax rate. And of course, you have to maintain proper books of accounts where you can segregate that what are your qualifying and non-qualifying income. So, and uh, of course, as I mentioned that if you fail de minimis test once, then for one plus another four total five years, you cannot claim the uh, uh, qualifying freeze on person benefit and uh, get the zero percent tax uh, rate. Uh, of course, as I mentioned earlier, all the free zones have an option to select uh, before the beginning of, let's say, the financial year. You can select that. Yes, would you like to go for the qualifying free zone person benefit and claim zero percent tax, or would you want to go for the normal tax regime of? minimum 375,000, zero percent and beyond that nine percent. So that all will depend on now your calculation and split between the uh, qualifying income and non-qualifying income and whether you are able to satisfy the de minimis test. So that's on the qualifying free zone. Uh, let me just recap primarily on what as a free zone company you will need to do. First, of course, uh, is that you will need to see whether you are in a free zone, which will be called a qualifying free zone. So that you'll have to check with your free zone authority. Second, you'll have to fulfill all the conditions of being uh, called a qualifying free zone person, which we saw earlier, uh, like, you know, maintaining substance, uh, meeting de minimis requirements, audited financials, uh, and all those. Then also you need to know who are your customer? Are they free zone or non-free zone? Based on that, you will have to see that the transaction that you are doing with your customers, are they falling within qualifying activities or are they excluded or are they others, meaning that domestic PE, foreign PE or uh, immovable property related income. Based on that, you will have to determine that how much is your qualifying income, how much is non-qualifying and calculate the de minimis. And of course, if you are found to be eligible, you evaluate uh, and decide you want to go with free zone person or you would like to go with the normal tax regime. Uh, so this is broadly on the free zone person. I'm sure there will be many questions with respect to this. However, uh, we will take the Q&A after uh, my colleague presence on the other two aspects. Uh, so if you have any questions, please feel free to write in the chat or Q&A. And we will take the questions after uh, the second uh, presentation. Thank you, everyone. I'll hand it over to Prasad now. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. That was quite insightful. I know uh, free zone uh, taxability is quite tricky and uh, it requires a lot of analysis, uh, financial analysis to make the correct decision. So, I will be now sharing my screen. Uh, is my screen visible? Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'll be uh, taking the uh, second part of this session. Uh, my focus today will be on uh, uh, three aspects uh, the deductible expenditure uh, allowable expenditure uh, as per the corporate tax law uh, main focus will be on the interest uh, deduction and the limitation rule the uh, cabinet decision for the interest de uh, deduction has uh, come and uh, we'll look into that uh, in detail and certain non-deductible expenditure so let's uh, dive into this uh, i'll just go quickly through the list of deductible expenditures. Uh, the deductible expenditures, obviously the first thing is that those expenses uh, have to be incurred for the taxable person's business and they have they should not be capital in nature. So right now we are talking about the expenses which you can deduct from your revenue in order to arrive at the taxable income. So the first and foremost requirement is that expense should be 
business related and not capital in nature. It should be expenses which is uh, incurred for the generation of non-exempted income. So if you are incurring any expense for exempted income, that will not be allowable. The third thing is the interest expenditure that we will see in the next slide. Entertainment expenditure, they have capped to 50% of the entertainment expenditure. So if you have incurred 100 uh, dirhams of entertainment, only 50%, that is 50 dirhams will be allowable as deduction. And uh, specifically, they have said that payments to connected persons, like your directors, uh, marine director, other directors, uh, connected persons or late parties of such uh, key management personnel, all these payments have to correspond to the market value. So you cannot pay arbitrarily to your connected persons. Whatever amount of salary, management fee or whatever you pay to them have to be in line with the market value. Now that will is going to be a challenge in determining what is the market value of such payments. But the law states that you need to determine the market value of that service and that much amount can be deducted. And who are connected persons? So obviously the owners, related party of owners, directors, officers, related party of directors and officers are treated as connected persons. But today we will focus on uh, the interest expenditure deduction. So as you can see, the interest expense deduction as per the cabinet decision, you have to calculate your interest for the tax period and the interest which we are talking about is the net interest. Net interest is the total interest expense minus the total interest income. So first of all, you have to calculate your total net interest expense. Then you have to see whether your net interest expense, is it exceeding 12 million dirhams in your tax period? If it is not exceeding 12 million dirhams, then the entire amount of your interest expense is fully deductible. So as long as your net interest is up to 12 million, you do not have to worry. You can claim that entire interest as a deduction from your total revenue. However, if your interest is exceeding 12 million, if your net interest is exceeding 12 million dirhams, in that case, the maximum deduction allowable will be 30% of EBITDA or 12 million, whichever is higher. Now, we have to calculate 30% of EBITDA. What is EBITDA? Earning before interest, tax, depreciation and amortization. How do we calculate that? So we, obviously it is an earning before interest and tax. So we are talking about the positive uh, figure that is, it should be greater than zero or the net taxable income as calculated as per the city law. Now here we are not talking about the accounting profit. We are talking about the taxable income, which is calculated as per the city law. In that taxable income, you, if you have deducted the interest expense, net interest expense, add that back and depreciation and amortization that also you add back to arrive at the earning before interest tax and depreciation again, we are not talking about adding back the interest and depreciation on the accounting profit. No, we are talking of calculating the net taxable income without interest and depreciation and amortization. That EBITDA, you calculate 30%, compare with 12 million, that is the maximum amount or whichever is higher, that is the maximum amount of deduction, interest deduction you can claim in a tax period. Now, Net interest expenditure. Now, what does this interest expenditure include? So interest expenditure will include obviously the compensation made for use of money or for an debt obligation. So any type of interest paid on any loan from banks, financial institutions, or any form of loans from others. Even the finance element of finance lease or non-finance lease also will be covered as per IFR 16. If you are, uh, if you are having uh, finance lease and the interest factor in that finance lease, okay, it will also be included in, in, in the interest expenditure. Even the fees or bank charges like guarantee fees, arrangement fees, commitment fees, all these also will be included in the interest expenditure. 
and even the interest uh, equivalent component in the Islamic financial instruments. Usually Islamic financial instruments do not carry interest, but you will have to calculate the interest component in that and that also can be included in the interest expenditure. Also any foreign exchange gains and losses accruing from interest, that also will be considered as a part of interest. Also, I would just like to highlight one more thing. Suppose your total interest is 15 million. So which is exceeding 12 million. So you'll have to calculate the EBITDA, 30% of EBITDA. And that is the maximum cap you can get. Suppose the 30% of EBITDA is coming at 11 million. So maximum uh, you can claim is up to 12 million, right? And your total interest is 15 million. Then what happens to the interest which you cannot claim of 3 million? So the law says that that unclaimed interest you can carry forward for the uh, future periods to be set off against the future profits. Now, what are the non-deductible expenses? I'll just go briefly on non-deductible expenses, donations, grants, gift to non-qualifying public entity, fines and penalties cannot be deducted from your revenue, bribes or other illicit payments cannot be deducted, dividends, obviously that is a uh, item after the profit, so that cannot be deducted, any drawings cannot be deducted, any recoverable input, input tax cannot be deducted, corporate tax imposed, tax on income imposed outside UAE, that also cannot be deducted from your total revenue. So these are the non-deductible expenditures. So this is as far as the deduction of expenses from your revenue, focusing mainly on the interest factor or the interest expense we have just discussed. Now the second aspect of my uh, discussion today will be transitional rules. Now, transitional rules are embedded in the corporate tax law and obviously it's ministerial decisions to ensure that entities are not put in a disadvantageous position due to the introduction of CT. I'll give you a simple example. Say, for example, you have bought a property before the introduction of CT. Say you have bought a property in 2020 and you're selling the property, say, in 2026. When you sell the property in 26, you will obviously get a gain on uh, uh, sale. You might get a loss also, but let us assume you get a gain. Then in 26, that entire gain will be added to your revenue and will be taxable. But the law says that since the property you have held for say seven years, so whatever profit you attribute to the pre-tax period for on that gain or on, on that profit, you need not pay corporate tax. So how do we calculate that pre-tax or post-tax profit for certain type of gains? That we will see in transitional rules. So the first uh, transitional rules is for adjustments to immovable property owned prior to the first tax period. So if you have a property which you are holding before the implement uh, before the uh, before your first tax period then in that case you can take the benefit of this adjustment but for this you require to have a qualifying immovable property what is a qualifying immovable property so a qualifying immovable property is a property which is owned before the first tax period which is measured in financials on historical cost basis. So if you are measuring at fair value, then you cannot, it cannot be termed as a qualifying in bull property. It is to be measured at historical cost basis. And it is disposed of or deemed to be disposed of during or after the first period for a value greater than net book value. So you're assuming or you're assuming that the property will be sold in the future periods, in the first tax period or future periods, and it will be sold at a profit. It will be sold greater than the carrying amount or the book value of the asset. 
Now, how do we calculate or how, how do we bifurcate the gain which is uh, availed post the tax period during the year of sale? Now, they have given two methods to do to calculate the gain. Instead of going in the theoretical aspect, let us just see a live example. So we have assumed, I have assumed certain uh, fictitious figures wherein the purchase price of the property is say 5 million. You have bought the property on uh, 1st January 20 and estimated useful life is 20 years. Your first tax period is, uh, we are assuming it is from January 24. You have sold this property in 26. And at the time of sale, the actual sales price is 15 million. So there are two options on how you can split the gain or profit which you generate on this, on this uh, sale in the year 26. So let us see option one. The step one is to calculate the WDV till the end of the year or the starting of the your tax period. So we have bought the property in 2020. So we have three, four years of depreciation. So the book value of the property as on December 23, that is your end of uh, financial year 23 and the starting of your tax period, 1-1-24, your, WD, uh, your book value is 4 million. Then step two, you will have to calculate them or find the market value of your property as on this date, that is on 31st December 23. You will have to calculate the market value of the property. And from that, you subtract the cost or book value, whichever is higher. Now, our cost is 5 million, book value is 4 million. So, 5 million is higher, you subtract from the market value. So, you get an estimated gain for pre tax period. So, this is your gain for pre tax period. So, if you had, would have sold this property in 23 before the tax, start, tax period starts, you would have got a gain of 7 million. Then step three, obviously, you're not selling in 23, you're selling in 26. So till 26, you find the book value. So for another three years, we are depreciating it. And the book value is on the year of sale is 3.25 million. And the final step is now we calculate how much gain is subject to corporate tax. So the actual selling price is 15 million in the year of sale, that is in 26. Book value as on 26 is 3.2 million which we have depreciated and it is 3.2. So the gain is actual gain is 11.75 million. From this 11.75 million, you can subtract the estimated gain, which we had uh, calculated previously as on 31st December 23, 7 million. So the balance 4.7 million is the gain post tax in the tax period, post implementation. On that gain of 4.7 million, you are subject to, uh, that is subject to 9% CT. They have also given another option to calculate this. The second option is that, again, you calculate the, uh, what is your actual selling price. From that, you subtract your cost or book value, whatever is higher, that is 5 million. So you get a gain on sale, gain on sale of property, 10 million. This is not the actual gain. This is just a gain to calculate the pre-tax gain. Then step two, you are supposed to calculate the days, number of days you have held a property in the pre-tax period. What is the percentage of that? So in our case, we have bought the property in January 20 and we are, uh, our tax period starts on 1-1-24. So we have held the property for four years. So if you calculate in days, it is 1-4-6-0 days. And what is the total days of holding? So that is from 20 till the year of sale, 26. So it is two triple five days. So the percentage of holding in the pre-tax period comes to around 57%. So that is the 57% is the percentage of holding of that property in our, in the pre-tax period. Now let us calculate the actual gain. So gain on the sale of property is 10 million. 57% of 10 million, that is 5.7 million will be at 0%. So whatever gain we had calculated, 57% of that will be 5.7 million. That will be at 0%. So how much will be taxable? 
then we calculate the actual gain. So the selling price was 15 million. A book value as on 26 in the year of sale was 3.2 million as we had calculated. So the gain is 11.7. From that, we subtract that 5.7 million gain which we have previously calculated. So the balance 6 million is subject to 9% uh, CT. So here, if you see in this example, option one is a bit beneficial because the gain is less in option one, but it may be, it may vary uh, depending on the case to case basis. So you'll have to select the option, whichever is more beneficial to the entity. I know this has a lot of working in calculations, but uh, these are two options which uh, are given in the ministerial decision in which you need to, if you want the benefit of this, you can avail the benefit. Obviously, this is an option given. So in your first, uh, in your first CT, when you're filing, you will have to uh, tell the authority whether you are going for this option of transitional provisions or not. So you have, you have to elect in the first tax period itself. Mind, uh, uh, mind that election is not for the option. You're not telling the authority that I will go for option one or option two. No. Election is that whether you will go for this adjustment or not. Whether you are going for this adjustment or you, are, you don't want this adjustment and whatever gain I will get in the year of sale, I'm willing to pay full CT on that. That you will have to tell to the authority in the first return. So this is the adjustment for immovable property. If you are having an immovable property, existing immovable property before the starting of the tax period. Same way, other than immovable property, if you have an intangible asset, then also you can elect this uh, option. In intangible asset, however, there is only one option, the number of days option, you can calculate the gain based on the number of days and uh, find out which, how much uh, gain will be subject to 0% and how much will be at 9%. Now, what is an, again, an intangible asset, a qualifying intangible asset, it should be owned before the first tax period. So it has to be before 24. Uh, again, it has to be measured at historical cost basis. And you are uh, assuming that it will be sold or transferred later on, which is uh, the value will be greater than the net book value. Again, here also, uh, one condition uh, is that the number of days which we calculate, the total days in the pre-tax period, the pre-tax period days should not exceed 10 years except in certain circumstances where it can go beyond 10 years, but that has to be approved by the federal tax authority. But it, maximum number of days holding for pre-tax should not be more than 10 years. And here also you'll have to tell the authority whether you will are willing to go for this uh, benefit of adjustments of gain uh, in the first tax period itself. Same way for any other financial assets or liabilities which you are having as on the date of the implementation of uh, as on the date of your first tax period. And uh, these financial assets or liabilities you are holding on the first tax period as well as they are, uh, the, they are uh, uh, disclosed or uh, presented on historical cost basis. You have again an option to select uh, how the gain on this will be dealt with in during the in the year of uh, transfer. And uh, you can opt again here also, you can opt the sale or cost, compare that, find the gain and see that how much is subject to 0% CT and how much is subject to 9%. Same here, you'll also, also have to uh, di disclose this in the first tax return that you will be going for this option for any financial assets and liabilities. Financial assets, basically any investment in equity shares or investment in debentures, or um, uh, uh, investment in the associates or joint ventures. If you have, those are financial assets and you can claim this benefit of adjusting the gains or losses on these assets uh, through this provision. So uh, this is uh, what uh, my presentation was today. Uh, I hope uh, it was, uh, uh, I, I had tried to made it, make it uh, as simple as possible. So uh, over to you, Kul, sir. Uh, thank you, Prasad, for uh, the detail on the transitional provisions and the uh, deductible expenditure, including the uh, interest uh, deduction.
Uh, can you stop uh, share, please? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'll. Uh, I think a lot of information has been shared today. I will not like to take too much time now and just briefly touch upon the accounting system and records because what is going to happen is your accounting system and the records are going to be the key in determining what will be your taxable income because the tax law corporate tax law very clearly mentions that taxable income shall be determined based on the adequate standalone financial statements and which are prepared in accordance with standards accepted in uae so if you see here two things are very key standalone financial statements so every company will have to have separate financial statements so you'll have to have separate books of accounts this would mean if you have multiple licenses operating in different emirate which are not branches but which are separate companies though it might be owned by the same person you will have to maintain separate books of accounts and prepare the financial statements and if you are going to file as tax group also it clearly mentions that you though you file the consolidated financial statement which have to be prepared based on the standalone financial statements so it is very necessary that your accounts have to be maintained now separately for each company based on the licenses that you have uh, of course branch will be considered as part of the uh, main company so you may not need to maintain except if you are in free zone and you have a mainland branch or domestic PE then you will have to maintain proper books to prove that what is the income of that uh, mainland branch but otherwise it can be part of the same financials uh, and prepared in accordance uh, with the accounting standards accepted and this also has been clarified by the authority that up to 50 million dirham uh, you can follow the IFRS for SME. Uh, if your gross revenue is less than or equal to 50 million, you can follow IFRS for SME. But any company which has revenue of more than 50 million dirham will have to apply full IFRS. So this also has been clarified that these are the acceptable accounting standards as per uh, UAE co corporate tax law. I'll quickly move on to, uh, again, how your taxable income will be computed. So, you know, your accounting income or profit loss as per your financial statement will be the starting point in that you will have to then do adjustments of unrealized gains or losses because what happens as per IFRS, you, you know, do market value or fair valuation of many assets and liabilities. And as a result of that, you book unrealized gains or losses, whereas corporate tax law gives you the flexibility that you can choose that on a certain type of assets uh, you know which are capital in nature or which are basically your investments and all that you can choose that the gains should be taxed only on realization so not on an annual basis when you fair value it so you can remove those gains or you'll have to adjust the losses then there are exempt income that you can remove like you know dividend income or uh, capital gains based on participation interest then there are trans reliefs you know you can transfer within qualifying group uh, losses or even you know you can uh, do the business transfer then certain expenditure may not be permitted as prasad mentioned that there are some non deductible expenditure so everything you might still deduct when you calculate your book profit but when you calculate tax profit certain expenditure like interest you have a cap of 30 percent or 12 million whichever is higher or entertainment for customers suppliers or shareholders directors may not be allowed so uh, bribes fines penalties you know these will not be allowed so you need to remove those uh, then transactions with related parties and connected person if they are on not on arm's length basis, suppose you have sold, for example, uh, goods at 100, but the real price of that should be, let's say, 120, then technically it might be uh, possible that, you know, authorities can say that, no, your actual sale price has to be 120 and you have to record 120 in the books and pay tax on it. So, you know, those adjustments, tax loss relief, like, you know, past losses, you can carry forward and set off against the current year uh, profits. Uh, there are certain incentive special uh, reliefs which are for qualifying business activity and uh, then there are some 
uh, income or expense which are not to be considered for determining taxable income or some other adjustments. And once you have all these adjustments, you come to taxable profit or loss. And that is the amount on which you then calculate your tax liability. That is in brief. Uh, I'll just uh, skip on this primarily and I'll go on to now as companies, what every company will need to do briefly in the next five minutes and then we'll move on to the Q&A. So the first and foremost, every company will need to now see their business operation and what are the structure of entities. As I mentioned, you know, there are possibilities that and that is the practice widely prevalent in UAE that you have one business, but you have multiple companies and licenses to carry out that one business uh, because of uh, Emirate, you know, requirement that you want to operate in Dubai and Abu Dhabi and Sharjah, but all your billing, all your expenses are recorded in only one company. Now, this is going to be a challenge. You will have to segregate because you'll have to prepare separate books of accounts for each of those companies. Or you'll have to also see that can you do a tax grouping if you have a parent subsidiary relationship between the companies? Can you make a tax grouping? And is it advisable? Is it uh, beneficial to you to make a tax group or to leave it as separate entities? Uh, then even the shareholding structure, many a times you might have different shareholding structure, uh, though it might be within your family members, but husband might be owning in one company shares, another company wife might be the shareholder or son might be the shareholder. Now this you will have to align it because if you don't align and if you don't have common shareholding of 75% or more between different entities, then you cannot transfer the tax losses from one entity to another entity. And you can't set it off against profit of another entity. So this alignment will have to be done. Your financial and tax periods also you'll have to determine because different companies having different financial years, you'll have to align it if you want to get certain benefits of either tax grouping. Uh, accounting systems will need to be streamlined. Uh, if you follow IFRS or you do not follow IFRS, you'll have to make sure that you are now in compliance with either I have full IFRS or IFRS for SME based on your turnover limits. One most important part which will come in now as well as year on year, even before the implementation of uh, corporate tax, uh, the financial year that you close in December 23 or 22 also, there might be some deferred tax asset uh, or liability which may be created. And this is purely because Every year, if you see your accounting profit and tax profit are going to be different. And because of which there is a possibility that there are some different tax assets and liabilities created and which you will have to account for in your books of accounts. Uh, record has to be maintained because record retention required as per CT law is seven years minimum. But if before end of seven years, if you get a notice of assessment, then it becomes indefinite till the assessment gets completed. So you'll have to also have a system that you are maintaining those records or documents in soft copy, hard copy, whatever way and that gets retained because at the time of assessment, you'll be required to produce all this. What are the expenditures which will be permitted uh, and what are the RP and connected person transactions, whether they are on arm's length basis. So the first and foremost will be to identify which are the related parties as per CT law on connected persons and then identify transactions and then determine that are they on arm's length basis or not? If not, what will be the impact on your financials if you have to bring it to arm's length basis and what could be the possible CT impact? Uh, also, consider past financials or future projections because you'll have to determine what are the possible uh, adjustments because prima facie, uh, you know, like qualifying free zone person that we saw, uh, if you do not fulfill de minimis, so if you have non-qualifying income, which is much more than 5% or 5 million, you fail the de minimis test and you lose the free zone benefit. In that case, would you want to restructure operations? Of course, having said that, you have to also look at, there is general anti-abuse rules, which have kicked in when the tax law was announced in December 22. So if you do some, restructuring just to avail the tax benefits, it could fall foul of the anti-abuse rules and it could be disallowed. So again, if there are commercial justifications and reasoning, uh, you might be able to, you know, uh, do those. So again, you'll have to see that, you know, follow the law to the fullest extent and we don't cross the boundary or the line which are set by the law. 
uh, also carry forward and set off of loss of course you can't carry forward the past losses uh, but the losses which you incur from the day of the first tax period is something which you carry forward so accordingly your accounting system will also have to be tuned you will need to know how much tax losses set off uh, in subsequent years what is still to be carried forward uh, your CT impact also that how much will be your anticipated taxable income and your corporate tax because that will have cash flow impact also because that you will need to pay. Uh, with that, I, I think I'll conclude on uh, the presentation. Uh, of course, we at uh, Kothari Auditors will be available uh, to carry out the detailed uh, possible, you know, impact assessment and support in terms of implementation and uh, of course for the filing of the tax returns also. Uh, going forward. So with that, I will conclude my presentation and uh, I will uh, hand it over to Jyotika uh, for the Q&A session. And uh, with me then, I uh, will join uh, two other panelists, uh, Prasad and uh, Kapil. Thank you, sir. That was a detailed session. We'll now move on to the questions raised by the participants. Uh, we have the first question on transitional rules. Um, in step number two, how to get the market value of the asset? So uh, the uh, law says that market value to be determined by the relevant government competent authority. So we assume that there might be certain approved uh, valuers which might come into picture and they would give the certificate of market value and that we need to use. But I think in the question, uh, they have asked for uh, market value of machine. They are uh, saying by way of machines, but uh, machines will not be covered because uh, machine is a property, plant and equipment. Here, transitional rules will be applicable only to immovable property or uh, intangible assets or any financial assets. So fixed assets or PPE will not be covered under transitional rules. Thank you, sir. Next question. In IT distribution industry, how do you ensure trading with QFZB customer is ultimate user of the product. Trading with qualifying free zone person will be considered as qualifying or not qualifying income. Uh, sorry, can you repeat that, uh, Jyoti? In IT distribution industry, how do you mm -hmm. ensure if you're trading with a qualifying free zone person customer? Um, I think the intention is to um, understand how do you determine whether your customer is a free zone person or not when you're in the IT distribution industry. See, in any, any industry that you are in, obviously, when you sell to any person, you have to take their uh, due diligence documents in terms of their license. Uh, and uh, obviously, based on that, you will come to know that whether the other person to whom you are selling goods is a free zone person or not. See, it is not necessary that you have transactions with a qualifying free zone person. It is free zone to free zone. So, you know, other person has to be a free zone person. And that you can know based on the uh, license of the customer. One uh, catch here is the condition mentioned that you need to ensure that, that that free zone person who is buying from you is the beneficial recipient of the goods and services. Meaning he is not a sort of an intermediary or agent acting on behalf of someone and he just procures the material and gives it to someone else. So where, you know, this is going to be the challenge. How to determine that? Because how do you know that, you know, what arrangement customer of yours has and how is he going to utilize your goods or services? Thank you, sir. Next question. What is the benefit of being in a qualifying free zone option versus paying the tax? Kapil, uh, <laughs> would you like to take that? Yes. So, uh... Being a being in a qualifying free zone or being a qualifying free zone person, the primary and the, the primary benefit is uh, of uh, being eligible for a zero percent uh, corporate tax regime on your qualifying income, and uh, of course that with with uh, always with some benefits. There is a one rule in the world: if there is if you are given some benefits, you have some responsibilities as well. So for that, you will have to fulfill certain conditions and uh, you have to make sure that you don't uh, uh, avoid that. And uh, if you pay the tax, you don't have to fulfill those conditions. So you don't have to stress your brain with respect to whether I am fulfilling those conditions or not. So every company has to uh, look into the benefits and the drawbacks and uh, decide on the same. Uh, 
Yotika. Uh, yes, Yotika. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, yes. Next question. How much of owner remuneration can be deducted from CT? Uh, this is a very subjective topic uh, because the CT law says that connected person compensation or transaction with connected person has to be at market rates. Now, how do you determine a market rate? So it is, as I would say, you know, probably the approach that I might suggest to take is, uh, see, uh, no approach may be 100% accurate. Uh, it will evolve over a period of time because you cannot say that a managing director or a director of company A is worth 100,000 or company B is worth million in terms of services rendering or 5 million. It is all subject uh, to, you know, primarily the size of the company, the nature of operations and the business that that company is into, the uh, skill sets that that person brings on table and the responsibilities that that person is carrying. It's a factor of all this matters. So, you know, depending on that, you have to assess that. Assume, for example, you need a, a director who is currently handling finance matters, for example of the company. So suppose if you don't have that connected person as a director finance and you get an independent CFO to handle your functions, probably what would have been the cost? I would put it that, you know, probably something similar to that or somewhere nearby provided, you know, Apple to Apple comparison that what that person brings in and what strength this person director existing has, is it matching? then you can say that yes that particular rate is something which is more or less market rate yes, so this evaluation has to be done on a case to case basis there is no thumb rule saying that you just take 2% or 5% or 10% of your revenue as remuneration no that's that will not work in my view thank you sir um, next question is regarding qualifying free zone are you required to maintain audited financials if you are a qualifying free zone person Kapil. Yes. Uh, so if, if you are a qualifying free zone person, yes, you have to uh, maintain audited financials. That is one of the conditions that uh, needs to be fulfilled in order to claim that benefit. Thank you, sir. Um, next question is on EBITDA, uh, the general interest reduction rule. Is leasehold interest also included in the 30% of EBITDA? Yeah, so the net interest includes the um, interest as per the IFRS 16, the interest on the finance lease portion. Net interest is included in the calculation of uh, the interest which is deductible. Thank you, sir. Next is a question on related parties. Um, what is meant by fourth degree of kinship? Uh, up to fourth degree of relationship, you would say. So you can say probably let's say grandfather, father, son and grandson. I mean, that's the kind of fourth degree of kinship. So it could be vertical, it could be horizontal. So it could be in any way, uh, you know, so that uh, is a very wide, uh, uh, you know, connection. Next question. When is the registration for corporate tax to be completed or when is the last day? So uh, the FTA as on date has not to come out with the last day to register for corporate tax, but uh, currently we are uh, registering many of our clients for corporate tax. So the registrations are currently ongoing for uh, uh, mainland companies and public joint stock companies, not for the free zone companies. So yes, you can contact us definitely. Thank you, sir. Um, interest on loan from partner, is it an allowable expenditure and will it get covered under payments to connected persons? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, yes, the interest on uh, loan from partner will be an allowable expenditure. However, it will also get covered under payments to connected persons. So the condition with respect to uh, payment to connected persons that in the sense that it has to be at market value that will have to be fulfilled and only then it will be allowed. Thank you, sir. Next question is regarding payments to employees. Um, regarding the commission and bonus payments to employees, which is not mentioned in the employee contract, but paid as part of company policy. In this case, employee, uh, you may not have everything written in that, but obviously, you know, there would be some sort of uh, agreement in place that employee would be entitled to bonus based on the performance of the company. 
or it could be linked to the turnover or the profits of the company. So, you know, as long as these conditions are there, what I would suggest is all companies should actually align their labor contracts in line with actual salaries that are being paid. Many a times salary being paid might be X, but in the labor contract, it might be old contract at lower rates. So first align that. Other allowances also that you are paying or, uh, you know, you have policy, you have it documented in a policy and include either in the labor contract or as an ad addendum to that, uh, a letter stating that yes, employee will be entitled to A, B, C, D, you know, these uh, allowances. In that, you can also have this bonus that he'll be entitled to bonus based on this. See, any uh, justifiable business expenditure which are incurred and which are of revenue nature will be allowed. And as long as it's employee payments, which you can justify that, yes, it is for the business purpose and paid to your employee. Yes, it would be permitted. I uh, have the documentation right available with you to justify that. Thank you, sir. Um, if financials are combined for a mainland and a free zone company, do we now have to maintain separate audited financials? uh if uh, if the finance yes you have to maintain separate audited financials for uh, if for these companies any company any juridical person uh if till now if financials are combined we will have to maintain separate trial balances separate books of accounts i would also say maintain separate bank accounts because uh it is better it is advisable that all the companies make their own separate payments and receive, receive their own funds because in case if some com some group company receives or pays money on behalf of the other group company, uh, it is not against the law, but again, that arm's length pricing rule will come into the picture and that will have to be fulfilled. So uh, yes, to cut it short, yes, the financials have to be maintained separately. Thank you, sir. If a free zone company opts to be subject to 9% CT, does it then not need to prepare or submit audited financials? So if, if it if it opts to be subject to 9% corporate tax, then obviously it is, uh, it is opting not to be treated as a qualifying free zone person. Then with respect to that, no. But however, there is a, uh, another provision which says that if your turnover is more than 50 million dirhams, then you will have to maintain audited financial statements. However, it is also advisable if you are, even if you are below 50 million dirhams, it is still advisable to maintain a audited financial statement because at the time of uh, corporate tax assessments, uh, the FTA will definitely ask for a financial statement in order to uh, proceed and calculate income as per them. Thank you, sir. We have a question on corporate tax registration. Is the registration open for all entities as of now? The registration is open only for uh, mainland companies and public joint stock companies. It is not open for uh, free zone companies. So as and when it is, uh, it does open for free zone companies, uh, we will update our clients and uh, we can, you, they can contact us. When will free zone companies be required to register for corporate tax? And is the qualifying threshold the net income exceeding 83,000, or more? When, uh, when will they be required to register for corporate tax is dependent upon the FTA, as in when the FTA issues the notification, we can uh, register them for corporate tax. However, practically, uh, we have heard uh, the some free zone companies uh, applying for the registration and they getting the corporate tax registration. But uh, since it is uh, actually the notification is not being issued, it is advisable not to register as of now. And uh, yes, the, the net income exemption, the private, the basic exemption is 375,000 uh, 375, dirhams. Uh, let me just add one thing here. Uh, see on the registration part, though it has opened for some of the entities, uh, you know, what we suggest is first you do your assessment, how ready you are, what changes you need to do, whether you need to change your uh, holding structure, shareholding, do you want to go for tax grouping or you want to go for individual registrations? Uh, even if you go for individual, uh, can you probably, you know, uh, do tax losses transfer or not? Because if not, then you might want to do change in your shareholding structure. Now, you know, all these things needs to be first evaluated 
then you go ahead and register because if you register today and then you probably think that no you may want it might have wanted to form a tax group then it becomes challenging because then you'll have to maybe deregister or you know form a part of tax group and change your registration so registration anyway no deadline has yet been specified by the authority and i'm sure they will give some time to all the companies uh, because every company needs to evaluate the impact of corporate tax on their processes systems and structure and then take a call about the registration so wait for some time first before you do the assessment and then you uh, you know go ahead with the registration unless of course there is specific compulsion by the authority uh, then definitely you will need to register otherwise you have time to register there is no uh, penalty as of now for any uh, non registration or delayed you need to register before uh, you know you do the filings but eventually you know you will have enough time for many of the companies for that thank you sir if a uae free zone company is doing trading in indian share market as well as fno in indian market is the income on from this activity covered under qualifying income So, yes. yes. So, uh, if a free zone company is uh, doing this activity, so it will be see for a qualifying activity. We see whether whether the, if the we are doing a transaction with a free zone person or a non free zone person. So, if we are doing doing an activity on a capital market list on a stock exchange, we don't know who the opposite person is whom with whom we are transacting. so it, it it all depends that uh, that whether the opposite person is not a free zone person then uh, obvious, obviously then if it is not a free zone person then we will have to see that whether it is a qualifying activity or not so wealth management and fund management services are qualifying activities so as far as that is concerned then it will be a it will be a qualifying income and you can take benefit of that i just want to add here uh, see in qualifying activity there is also one uh, more activity a holding of shares and securities that is also a qualifying activity yeah. so if a free zone is holding shares and securities uh, and of course uh, you are generating income out of it it will be considered as qualifying activity uh, so that uh, also will need to be looked at of course we'll have to see that it is not uh, falling in the excluded activity uh, which of course there are no such uh, i think excluded activities so in all probability yes uh, i think holding of shares and securities uh, since it is there as a qualifying activity uh, will probably form part of qualifying income and then subject to your de minimis requirement fulfillment uh, you may be able to claim the uh, benefit and it says holding of shares and securities so again it is a wider term uh, shares as well as securities so you know it could be any form of securities that you are holding so sort of investment companies which holds those assets thank you sir um next question which are the qualified free zones as of now no qualifying free zone list has been published by uh, ministry of finance and what has been mentioned uh, by them also is that the free zone will uh, inform and tell that you know does it fall as a part of qualifying free zone so as i mentioned every company will have to check the free zone charter under which it was formed uh, and see that whether tax holiday was granted and how many years of that tax holiday is still remaining whether it is valid or not uh, based on that you can determine best is you have to check with your own free zone where you are established and get a confirmation that yes it would be qualifying free zone and up to this in this period thank you sir Uh, upon the registration process itself do we need to determine the category of qualifying or non qualifying free zone person uh, second what is the registration threshold uh, there is no registration threshold every company which carries out business i mean every company per se whether it is dormant or it carries out business or not is required to register there is no exemption except you know some government entities and you know those which have exemption other than that every company has to register whether you make profits or losses or you don't do any business also you still are required to register no threshold for registration threshold is only for calculation of your tax 
Thank you, sir. There's a sub question to this um, whether the decision of whether you are qualifying or a non qualifying pre zone person needs to be made at the stage of registration itself. No, see, uh, now this thing is not clear right now, but as a, because you know, in the law, it is given that you have an option to elect. So, free zone company will have an option to elect. Probably, there is a possibility that every year they might have an option to elect that yes, they want to follow the normal regime or they want to go for the qualifying free zone uh, regime. Now, at the time of registration, this is not because uh, free zone registrations have not started, correct? Okay. So, uh, yeah. So primarily, uh, again, what specific to free zone they are all going to ask is not known, but my based on the law, uh, it seems that free zones will be given option year on year to determine they want to follow the normal regime or they would like to go for uh, the free zone regime. Thank you, sir. Is accommodation provided by the company to the owner allowable for deduction? Uh, falls under the connected person uh, compensation. So overall, entire compensation that you pay, you will have to justify, is it in line with the market? So if you hire an independent person, would you have provided accommodation uh, for that particular position? If you hire someone else, would you have provided? And uh, if so, how much value would you have provided? So it will all depend on you know that uh, uh, evaluation, I would say. Thank you, sir. Does a representative office of, a, of an overseas company based in the UAE, which provides sourcing and admin as well as sales support services, need to register for corporate tax, given that it has no revenue of itself? No, but it has, uh, that company will have a license, I'm assuming, in UAE. Now, if it has a license in UAE, it is a resident taxable juridical person. Very clear. And it is required to register. Now, whether it has income or does not have income is a secondary matter. Thank you, sir. Next question is regarding maintenance of books of accounts. We have multiple trade licenses without any commercial revenue transactions. In such case, should we maintain books of accounts only to book the expenses? Yes. Uh, so if so, the th yes, if you have uh, multiple trade licenses, you have multiple companies, uh, then you will have to maintain separate books of accounts whether you earn revenue or you don't earn revenue you only incur expenses you will have to maintain it is advisable to maintain separate books of accounts yes thank you so much. Uh, i think we can also take some questions if someone would like to ask i think you can raise hand and we can unmute also uh, so if anyone would like to ask a question uh, then you can please raise your hand. So we'll uh, unmute you. You can carry on with the questions. There are no raised hands here as yet. Yes. Does a JAFSA offshore company whose sole income consists of dividends from its overseas subsidiary need to register for CT? Yeah, I mean, every company in UAE will need to register. Uh, whether it's an offshore, free zone, mainland, every company will need to register. Is holding subsidiary relationship mandatory to make a tax group? Yes, for, to make a tax group, holding subsidiary relationship uh, is mandatory. There, there is a threshold for uh, uh, the shareholding. Uh, then, yes, it is mandatory. The parent subsidiary relationship is mandatory. Also withholding tax. Thing, uh, sorry, also on one more thing on this. Suppose if you have a holding company and down the line you have five subsidiaries, you will have to have holding as the group entity and subsidiaries. You can't just have subsidiaries grouped under one tax group and leaving out the holding company uh, as not part of the tax group. However, you can do the other way that you can have a holding company and out of five, you can elect to group only four subsidiaries or three, depending on now, you know, your assessment and planning. Thank you, sir. If withholding tax is paid in another country, can we claim credit in UAE? Withholding tax, see, uh, foreign tax credit is permitted, not withholding tax credit. So if a company has a foreign branch, for example, and it has paid tax in that jurisdiction on the profit of foreign branch, it can claim a set off up to the amount of UAE tax on that foreign branch profit. So suppose in uh, someone has a company, uh, sorry, branch office in India, 
uh, where you might pay 30% tax. Whereas UAE, you would pay 9%. So UAE will allow you offset of only up to 9%. You can't then set off another 21% against other income of other branches or other main company. But yes, uh, not withholding tax, but yes, for, uh, tax, uh, you know, for corporate tax that you're paid. Thank you, sir. Um, if a DMCC company does business with mainland companies, then does it qualify for 0% tax? I think look at the qualifying activities. Uh, you'll have to see uh, DMCC again. Are you a qualifying free zone person? First, you check that. Uh, if you are, then uh, you have to see are you carrying out qualifying activity, any of those 13 listed activities, uh, and not into the excluded activities. So it will be subject to you know, evaluation of what exact activity is being carried, being carried out and whether it falls in the qualifying activity or not. Thank you, sir. If a company is on the stage of VAT deregistration because of not reaching the threshold and no inflow in the company, is it still required to register for CT? So, uh, uh, as Vipul sir has rightfully said, all the companies uh, uh, incorporated within the UAE have to register for a corporate tax. Uh, whether uh, they are doing any activity or they are dormant, they have to register for corporate tax. Thank you, sir. I think that's it with the questions that have been asked in the QA. Okay, I think we'll just wait for uh, a minute in case if anyone has questions, uh, please raise your hand so we can unmute you. Uh, or else, uh, I would just like to thank each and every one of you for joining in today. And let me assure you that uh, as Kothari Auditors and Global Business Services, we are fully committed to serving you with the uh, highest of professional expertise with respect to corporate tax, uh, VAT, or any other compliance matters. And also, of course, audit and uh, you know accounting or any such services. So, you, you know, you can always uh, reach out to any of our team members. Uh, there is one uh, hand raise, uh, Mr. Stephen Nold. Uh, we are unmuted. Uh, please go ahead, Stephen. Yeah, hi, do you hear me? Yes, hi, I can hear you. Hi, Vipul. Hi. Um, if, enough, uh, sorry, if a free zone company opts to pay 9% corporate tax, do they then still have to submit audited financial statements? A uh, free zone company, if it opts for the normal regime of 9%, you are not required to submit uh, mm -hmm. the financial statements because, you know, the condition of maintaining and having audited financial statements is for qualifying free zone person, which wants to claim that benefit. Mm -hmm. So uh, there may not be a need to file. See, the filing requirements in terms of the uh, format of the tax return or what documents will need to be filed along with the tax return has not yet been published. Mm -hmm. So we are not clear on exactly what is required to be filed uh, in due course. Uh, but mm -hmm. the, my understanding is because you are not opting for a free zone benefit, you may not be required to file. Having said that, you will have to still maintain because at the time of assessment, oh, authority can always ask. And uh, see, as per the law also, every free zone has a rule that every company needs to maintain books of accounts and get it audited. They may not have filing requirement, but uh, audited financials in free zone or even mainland LLC, it is mandatory as per the law. But this is as, uh, up um, from if you have more than 15 million uh, revenue, right? Uh, see, that is as per the corporate tax law you are talking of. I'm talking from the commercial law perspective or the respective free zone regulation perspective. Mm -hmm. Very irrespective of the turnover that you might have, you are required to maintain accounts and get it audited. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, there is one more raise hand, Mr. Sudhir. Uh, Mr. Sudhir, we have unmuted you, so you can ask your question. Yeah, hello, sir. How are you? Good, thank you. Sir, I have a small question. This uh, audit report, after registering the corporate tax, let's go into the field. So is there any comp computation, a summary, like how the calculations are done, whether I did correct or not? You are going to audit and you are also going to... Uh, confirm that balance that we are going to, if, if we fall into the corporate tax, that 
means you will also audit and i will also audit everything will be in the safe mode see i mean as a part of audit of course calculation of corporate tax uh, or taxable income will not be a part of that but having said that yes we can always provide you that service of corporate tax assessment and calculation of how much your taxable income will be based on your audited financials and anyway that will need to be also done uh, because you know corporate tax impact and provisioning of corporate tax uh, in the books as well as deferred uh, assets liabilities will need to be recorded in the books correct recording is another part and also uh, we have to start from the scratch how the activity and the company's profiles everything we have yes, to be yes. everything Def has to be done yeah it has to be done that's what i mentioned that you know the assessment has to be done now uh, you need to start immediately if you have not already started is there any such uh, erp where uh, the gst calculations are done or the vat calculations are done from the tally or uh, books like this we have anything from the here not yet uh, i have not come across any software which will calculate your cor ue corporate tax but eventually i think in times to come it will come but again you we'll have to feed in the information in the right way then only it yeah. can calculate yeah. the right uh, way yeah because one one side we are we are following the vat vat type of culture another one is coming this ct so this is another cal uh, culture so how we are going to mix up yeah the software will take care i'm sure but again you know it all okay. depends on how your accounting system is structured how your chart of accounts is structured yeah and based on that uh, you know things will have to be looked at and identified so it's an evolving thing bear in mind mm. corporate tax has just been announced uh, in december uh, 22 clarifications have just come in and still some more clarifications to come in so it is evolving thank you sir okay thank you thank you sir um i think we have a few more questions coming up um, can a free zone and a mainland company form a tax group if the mainland company has the same non-local sponsors but hold 49% shares in mainland? So uh, a free zone uh, company and a mainland company cannot form a tax group because uh, one of the conditions to be fulfilled at that is that all the companies should not be uh, qualifying free zone companies. So yes, if uh, if that free zone company is a qualifying free zone company, then no, it cannot uh, uh, create a tax group. But if uh, but if if but if it chooses not to be a qualifying free zone company, then uh, the other conditions can be evaluated. If we restructure the expenses and bring in additional expense heads, which is allowable in nature under corporate tax, would that be considered anti-abusive? See, please bear in mind, uh, do not go for creative uh, accounting or do not uh, go for creative ways to, you know, just jack up your expense and minimize the liability. This is definitely something which is not advisable and not should not be done. So just to, you know, this is definitely all these things will fall foul of the anti-abuse rules. And having said that, see, let me just highlight here. Globally, what kind of tax rates are there? I think most of us are aware of. You pay taxes in the range of 20-30% plus. 9% is a very small percentage. Uh, and, you know, obviously, uh, the authorities here have kept that low, considering that, you know, this is, uh, they want to promote this as a business-friendly environment. Uh, with that, obviously, we should not unnecessarily abuse or no one should take that and just, you know, increase the cost just to reduce the uh, profits. So our, our uh, advice is very clearly do not go for such creative accounting or creative ways to, uh, you know, increase your costs or reduce expenses. N not, at, not at all. Thank you, sir. Uh, one last question. Can any CA firm sign the financials or does it have to be a local Imarati who signs the report before filing the CT return? No, audit can be conducted by any audit firm which is licensed in UAE. So any licensed auditor will be allowed to carry out the audit and uh, that audit report, if required to be filed, I'm sure should be acceptable as long as it is licensed auditor in UAE. Thank you, sir. I think that brings us to the end of the Q&A session. So thank you everyone for joining us today. It was a pleasure having you all with us. We hope most of your queries regarding the corporate tax would have been resolved by now. But if you still have any questions, 
please feel free to get back to us. We'll be happy to assist. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining in today. And we look forward to reconnecting with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll just end the session now. Thank you.